going to ask him a few questions about hypnosis. Good morning, Dr. Clough. Morning. Um, first of all, we'd just like to know uh, how you were first introduced to hypnosis. Well, it's not a very typical story. I was a medical student at Harvard, and I was on my psych rotation, and it was one of my nights on call. And we got a call early in the evening from someone who uh, was at a party where someone who had read a book on hypnosis had put someone into trance, and now they couldn't get them out. So they were going to bring this patient to the emergency ward in Mass Mental Health, and the resident on call would assess and treat. Well, the resident on call knew nothing about hypnosis, but he knew I was a speed reader. So I was sent up to the library at Mass Mental Health to uh, learn something about hypnosis. So if and when this person arrived, we would have some knowledge base to uh, draw upon. Well, I was, although medical school finally killed it uh, for me, I was a very, very fast speed reader. So I just started tearing through uh, some books on hypnosis and some articles on hypnosis. And there I was, speed reading like crazy at a very high rate. I can't do it anymore, but then I could. Uh, and the hours went by, on and on and on and on, and no other case came into the emergency services. Uh, so finally I looked up and it was 11.30 or so, and I, I hadn't been called to use my new skills in hypnosis. And um, so I called the resident, and I found that, well, that patient had never come in. So there I was, stuck with uh, about four plus hours of, of sped read material uh, on hypnosis at a time uh, that my mind was very receptive and very able to grasp almost everything it perceived. So with no knowledge uh, prior, I became overnight someone who absorbed several textbooks on hypnosis and a number of scholarly articles. So <laughs> the knowledge was there. Uh, when I came to be a resident, one of my first exposures to uh, the wonders of psychiatry was to go to an APA uh, convention in San Francisco. And somewhere, in addition to all the pleasures of San Francisco, I recall watching an early demonstration of Herb Spiegel's HIP. And, well, th this really was amazing to me. So now I kind of knew my way in, uh, in addition to having read all those books. Well, the price for having been covered while I went to the APA was I was on the moment I was back. And in the emergency ward was a young woman who developed acute agoraphobia. And with the temerity of youth and ample ignorance to go along with all I'd learned, I induced hypnosis and ablated the symptom. And uh, that was a very interesting experience. And then I went down to the library now at Hospital University of Pennsylvania and ultimately absorbed what that uh, library had uh, on hypnosis. And I discovered that on our faculty was someone whose books were there plenty, a guy named Jay Haley. And there was also another guy at Penn who really, I must say, shirked his teaching responsibilities, but he was there, named Martin Orn. And uh, while I hoped to learn from Haley and, from Haley and Orn, they made themselves rather inaccessible to the residents. But um, Alexander Yanofsky, one of the grand old men of American hypnosis, um, and a former collaborator of Piaget's in Europe, um, was teaching the actual hypnosis at Penn. And um, so I latched on to him. And he was such a subtle Ericksonian that I could not understand what he was doing, except that it was working. I became his teaching assistant for the next year. I could not understand what the man did. He was just amazingly above my skill level and was one of these Zen master types. He wasn't going to tell you how. Um, so I bought a copy of Hart <laughs> and 
put Hartman and Spiegel and everything else I'd read together with Yanofsky's wisdom and uh, began to use, use hypnosis in my uh, clinical work. Can you uh, tell us about some of the other uh, mentors or uh, people that have been important as you've uh, developed in hypnosis? Uh, well, it's hard to answer that one tactfully because in Philadelphia there were many great people in hypnosis and um, many of them had most amazing personalities. So suffice it to say, I uh, looked elsewhere for my training and uh, I had a wonderful uh, workshop with Erica Fromm and Doris Gruenwald and apart from that was largely uh, self-taught for a number of years and only gradually uh, came uh, to come to uh, various hypnosis meetings. So I, I didn't approach this in a very systematic manner. I was front-loaded with a lot of knowledge and no practice or experience and um, learned a lot by the seat of my pants and have been using hypnosis probably um, eight or nine years using it rather extensively before I caught up with the organized workshops and the national meetings. Uh, what would you say is your own uh, understanding or definition of hypnosis? You know, hypnosis is something I think I understand for about half an hour, maybe twice a year. Um, I am, I never cease to be amused by the theoretician's arguments that one model is um, able to explain the phenomena uh, to a satisfactory degree. I think that all the models that are currently available and some that are yet, as yet unimagined uh, probably have a piece of the a picture. In other words, I don't think we know what we're doing. I, um, I've always thought hypnosis was heterogeneous phenomena and that uh, any one of the paradigms or models might have been pretty good for one subsection of that group, but not for all. But I had no way of proving, I mean, th this was my clinical notion in working with people, that, uh, I mean, if, there, if Milton Erickson could get almost anyone into trance, and people using standard measures could get only a certain number of people into trance, then clearly either Milton Erickson was better than everyone else, which might have been the case, or Milton Erickson understood there were multiple pathways. And I thought it probably was a combination of Milton Erickson being a genius and intuitively knowing there were multiple pathways. And um, that's what I felt intuitively until Ron Pakala uh, published his wonderful attempts to quantify consciousness. And a, about a dozen and a half different uh, patterns of people entering trance. And finally I said, oh my God. You know, here is something that comes very close to what I see clinically. Uh, the statistics and some of the concepts are a little too abstract for me to feel very comfortable, but I, I feel a wonderful resonance with that work because it, it shows me what the substrates of those multiple paths um, might be. I'd be remiss if I didn't say how much I've learned from uh, Buddy Braun, my long association with Buddy Braun because um, I learned much less from him about DID uh, than I learned about hypnosis, because we were pretty equal in terms of our knowledge about dissociative disorders. But Buddy had me by a country mile on hypnosis. He knew all the techniques, knew all the practitioners, knew all the stories, um, knew that some things worked, even though people didn't really know why, or theories were stupid. So. Uh, Hanging out with Buddy, who was um, very intellectually skeptical of models and theories, but very um, eager to learn any pragmatic thing you could do, um, that's, that really taught me a lot, because he made me think about hypnosis. Could you tell us about um, uh, the roles you've played in the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and how long you've been a member? Well. I didn't know ASCH existed uh, until, uh, I guess, 79 or so. 
Um, I knew there was SCEH, and I'd gone to one meeting, um, and everyone at Penn who was affiliated with hypnosis was SCEH, SCEH, SCEH. And then Buddy um, invited me to be part of a symposium at ASCH with him, David Spiegel, and um, someone else whose name I forgot. And since I'd had a really hard time getting my work presented or accepted, and here was this group that was actually going to let me do it, uh, so I better join this group. So I joined ASCH uh, shortly after I was invited to the seminar, um, hoping I could find a forum and like minds, and I've been there ever since. I only missed one ASCH meeting uh, since then. Um, the roles I've played are mostly a uh, mostly consumer. <laughs> a consumer of friendship, a consumer of knowledge, a consumer of fellowship, a uh, consumer of arguments, a participant in arguments. Uh, officially, um, I think I've had every position on the Executive Council uh, except secretary, uh, chairperson or moderator of the uh, Bog and um, master's level representatives for disciplines I don't belong to. Uh, I started as um, the representative for medicine, um, and I just gradually uh, went up the line. And uh, after the obligatory initial run for presidency against someone who uh, deserved to have it before me, and getting my teeth kicked in in that election. And willingly so, because you know it's going to happen. I became president. Uh, have you seen some changes in the uh, use of hypnosis over the years that you've practiced? I've seen a lot of uh, changes, and I'm not sure all of them are good. Um, I've seen a greater uh, emphasis on the concept of hypnotizability. I've seen a greater emphasis on uh, on issues that used to be in the domain of forensic hypnosis, but since the whole false memory thing and uh, all those concerns have become more mainstream, much more informed consent. Um, I've seen what I consider the artistry of the older generation uh, waning in terms of more consistent, reliable, and frankly boring uh, work. Uh, by folks who have uh, more mainstream orientations, but frankly less artistry and less genius. I mean, I one of my things I despair of is um, the wonderful things I saw, and I'll pick Alexander Yanofsky because he's not generally known to this group. Um, all he knew is going to be lost. No one, you know, he never explained. He wouldn't take on, uh, he, he was a very unusual guy. Um, the real artistry of some of the uh, older generation, uh, I, I don't see as much creativity, interest, and focus on detail that would uh, characterize the generation that I admired when I was coming into the field. Uh, Milton Erickson really studied people. I mean, yes, he's so famous for shooting from the hip and hypnotizing a stranger who's in the bathroom three miles away, and they walk in and you know, trains. You know the, the many stories. But um, the older clinicians, having fewer tools, I think got to know the patients often a lot better. They, they really honed their develop their intuitive uh, skills a lot, and um, I don't think that's being uh, passed on as much. On the other hand, um, it's wonderful to see the advances of hypnosis uh, being used in behavioral medicine, and um, and more generally uh, than uh, I saw in the past. I mourn the. Uh, passing of hypnoanalysis from the mainstream. Um, cognitive behavioral can only take you so far. Uh, well, hypnoanalysis can only take you so far. But uh, 
there's a bunch of human treasures in that generation um, who are, I don't think, any longer passing on their knowledge in the way they had. And while there's some, um, some folks who keep that tradition very much alive, Dan Brown, Elkin Baker, um, others that don't immediately come to mind because I've just driven through this crazy weather. Uh, I, I think, I think the, um, the falling back of the old hypnoanalysts and their, their wisdom, I mean, give, give, give me Erica Fromm uh, at, at half her capacity against just about any of the uh, more, uh, we have a reliable and valid method types any day. And I wish those folks were, you know, at their prime. So what they do could have been more operationalized and uh, even manualized, like the Bo Laborski did for supportive expressive psychotherapy. Uh, I, I wish there had been a manualization of some of the artistry of the old, older generation, because um, even though it would have been a faint shadow of them in action, it would have pointed the way. And I think, I think um, uh, some of these trails aren't even marked by breadcrumbs anymore. That, I, I, think, I think it's been wonderful that uh, the, we've reached out to more disciplines. And um, when you think of how, what percentage of people are hypnotizable to one extent or another, and how even a minor degree of hypnotizability sometimes can really ameliorate, help ameliorate a person's condition, uh, they're never going to be enough um, top of the heap apex predator type practitioners to, to do that. Um, so I think um, while broadening the base always is a plus, has pluses and minuses as well as pluses, I think in terms of patient care, it's much to be desired and I've, I was very much in favor of the master's level people coming in. Um, and uh, I'm very glad that happened. Do you have some uh, predictions for the future of hypnosis? My fear is that hypno people will learn more and more about hypnosis and make it capable of doing more and more, but it will be available to less and less. I think our current healthcare system of the richest nation in the world is being castrated and um, decimated so that maybe we'll get going as good as there used to be in the old Cold War Soviet gulags. Um, I think the doctor-patient relationship is eroded. I think the relationships of all the helping disciplines have become far less compassionate in general. Um, and uh, consequently, my fear is we'll learn more and more, and hypnosis will be more and more available, but the people who use it will be able to use it less and less effectively. That's my fear. My hope is that um, somebody wakes up and uh, realizes that um, what's been happening in our healthcare delivery system uh, doesn't even guarantee mediocrity. Uh, I'd be satisfied with guaranteed mediocrity. Then. That's what you'd expect at, at a, of a system at its best, that the average of it, a level of skill and talent would be applied to the average patient, which would be mediocrity. <laughs> But, but okay, but I, I really, um, I'm in a very cynical and uh, pessimistic mood for the immediate future uh, of hypnosis as a clinical entity. I am very pleased with uh, some of the new brain research because I think it's going to teach us more and more about hypnosis and my hope is that as we learn more and more about what hypnosis is and what hypnosis can do on the really scientific studies, ha ha, uh, that there will be found a way to kind of mainstream it back in uh, and as a major modality. This is especially of concern to me in terms of trauma, because hypnosis and the treatment of trauma 
in the 80s and 90s was better than it is now because people are so worried about the being sued for its misuse that they've forgotten a lot of very basic research facts and that is most people who get PTSD symptoms it tails off but um, almost 50 percent still have it uh, at the end of a longer period of study, be that months or a couple of years. And if you follow that group, there's a very low decline. So in other words, of people who get post-traumatic responses, um, some get well spontaneously, some improve with therapy of all sorts early on, but a very high percentage are screwed for a long period of time, if not permanently. And there were two studies, one with Bliss as a senior author and one with Spiegel as a senior author, that demonstrate that in that group of chronic PTSD sufferers, they're characterized by a high hypnotizability. So, you know, we have another war going on, you know? So I'm, th I'm thinking um, hypnosis should be in the first aid kit uh, of the uh, units over there. It should be uh, in the hospitals in Germany. It should be in the hospitals stateside. And um, I don't think that's going to happen. But I'm hoping that brain research in another four or five years um, will make enough connections so even the most hard-headed folks can, bring, can see a reason to bring hypnosis back into the treatment of them chronically, uh, those with chronic post-traumatic symptoms. Because that's what I deal with all day, and hypnosis is very useful. Do you have your own favorite story about hypnosis that you could share with us? I would love to regale you with fantastic stories of recovered memories that later brought out under hypnosis that were later validated by uh, external corroboration. But my favorite is one that makes me look like, like a horse's ass, and I always use it for teaching because it, it demonstrates that if you don't listen to the patient, and if you ever accept the idea that you have to work so fast that you don't listen to the patient. Um, you may get lucky and you may look like a horse's patoot. Um, I was teaching a workshop in Chicago uh, in the mid-80s, a stress reduction workshop, and I, I was on that day. Um, I was very much on target. I was, I was witty, I was effective, people liked what I was teaching. So at the end of it, this this guy uh, walks up to me and says, uh, I gotta leave in 20 minutes for the airport. And you're really, you're really such an effective fellow. I wonder if you could give me some imagery that'll help me out. And he explains his problem. And he has Prince metal angina, a very bad chronic uh, re repetitive angina. And uh, he wants to know if there's some hypnotic imagery or metaphor he can use to um, deal with that more effectively. So thinking I'm getting background, uh, I learned this guy's from a place in Texas, very dry. Uh, he's from a cowboy. Uh, ranch background and, you know, some certain seasons uh, so dry that all the riverbeds are uh, just just stone, there's no, no liquid. So I'm thinking to myself, okay. Uh, he's giving me a metaphor. He's giving me a metaphor because um, the angina is due to not enough blood flowing through a particular river, an arterial river. So I put him in a trance. He goes right down. Whatever you think of the concept of depth, uh, whether it's fraudulent, social psychological artifact, uh, he, he achieved it very quickly. And um, I build up this metaphor where he's, he's on horseback and he's on a, on a rise and he's watching um, the parched, painfully parched land and um, that as he watches, um, some clouds come up and um, there's rain and um, the water comes and the earth is going to be 
rejuvenated, alive, uh, flow, everything flowing beautifully. So far, so good. Well, what happens is this guy looks pretty anxious, and um, I ask him um, if he's in discomfort, but the cowboy ain't going to tell me nothing like that. So I go with what he gives me. I take him through this, and um, at the end, he says, thank you very much, but I, um, I don't think I'll be using this uh, imagery. Because let me tell you what happened. He was there on his horse, starts to rain. Well, I didn't know how torrential those rains are and you know, what happens when that water starts to come. And uh, soon he and his horse are swept away by the flood. And I also didn't know that water is kind of threatening to this guy because he can't swim. So what I'm using as a metaphor to help him open up his coronaries is actually scaring the living bejesus out of him, giving him a near-death experience. He's getting awful chest pain, and he's too macho to tell me. So what he did was he figured if he could fantasize himself a river, he could fantasize himself a boat. So he uh, imagined this boat came along that he was able to climb into and then float along the river and then his pain started going down. <laughs> so going back to the managed care analogy, there's no excuse for doing anything without thorough knowledge of the patient. And uh, here I was succumbing to the pressure of the moment to do a slapdash intervention and yeah, I nearly hurt the guy real bad. So that's my cautionary tale about hypnosis. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, with us, and also thank you for uh, agreeing to this little videotape conversation. And I appreciate you sharing with us. My pleasure, Eric.